Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to the Spiritual Unity Radio Network, a station dedicated to the concept that all manifestations of the divine are equally valid. Join Reverend Terry Power HP, Robin McKean, and all the hosts for programming covering a wide range of spiritual topics right here on Blog Talk Radio. where we have the freedom to think about life without judgment. We take a look at society, we examine it, and we allow for the possibility of something new, something different. And now, here's your host, Alan Ritter. Welcome, everyone, to this Sunday night after Thanksgiving, just after Thanksgiving. In November of 2017, the 26th of November, welcome to this episode of An Emerging Forest. And tonight we have a very special guest, and her name is Barbara Zanelli. And Barbara is a local artist, local in Philly, local right now, but she has uh, studied uh, in the United States and abroad over her long career. So welcome to the show, Barbara. Thank you. Glad to be here. So I guess what we want to do is talk about your career and where one starts talking about your career is sort of what lo- what area of the world uh, did you start out in and what made it, what pulled you to, to do what you do and describe, describe the medium that you use uh, and just start the story. Sure. Um, well, it, ever since I could remember, uh, I was, Drawing, and my my family members can attest to that. Uh, I grew up on Long Island, and I was fortunate to have a mother who encouraged my drawing. And um, I was told that I used to draw on the wall uh, as, as soon as I was old enough to hold a pencil, and uh, uh, even uh, being punished <laughs> didn't stop me. <laughs> It was always an urge, and uh, everywhere I went, I had a sketchbook, whether it was church or school. When I started public school in fifth grade, I had to explain to my teacher that I listen better when I draw, and uh, my grades proved that I was right, so she let me continue to draw while she was talking, and then she started to appreciate all the little illustrations that I would leave next to spelling words. and uh, so, you know, all my art teachers, you know, fifth grade and, and up uh, were uh, Mrs. Kepler in my fifth grade drawing class. She let me do a huge mural in the back while everybody else did their own, you know, the assigned homework. Uh, so I, I got, I received a lot of encouragement growing up and, um, you know, that that spurred me on even even though my mom didn't couldn't afford private art lessons, which I really wanted, um, there was always just this knowing that this is just what I do. It was just being synonymous to me. You know, it was always part of my identity was drawing. Uh, 
And, you know, of course, by the time I was 10, 11, 12, I wanted to paint. And uh, and I, a woman from the church, um, I would bike down to her art studio when I was 13, and I had my first painting lesson with her, uh, Mrs. Winter. Um, and uh, we did some uh, painting down in Northport. Long Island, and then uh, high school, we had an amazing art program, and uh, and then I really took off there, um, especially uh, when I when I turned 16, I had the opportunity to go to Germany to see to visit my mother's family, and one of my aunts paid for me to go to the summer academy in Marburg, and I took a painting Frei Malerei class free painting where we mixed egg tempera outdoors on wallpaper and just painted in the fields while women and men did contact improv. <laughs> Here I was 16 and amidst probably the youngest person was 30 and the oldest maybe 75 and it was, I was thrilled, you know, to have wine on a picnic blanket in the middle of the field in Germany with all these eccentric adults. <laughs> Oh, my God. And then, you know, I signed up uh, for another uh, after-school program on Wednesdays called Monotypes. And I thought, you know, this is interesting with the printing press. And one day the printing press broke down, and uh, and as they were scuffling around figuring out what they were going to do, I was sitting there discovering that if I put my newsprint on my inked plate, I, I could draw these really cool things and I think accidentally I probably was drawing a picture on the newsprint while it was sitting on the ink and then I would lift up the paper and on the other side was the image and I and then I just got totally engrossed and, and I made like hundreds of these while I was sitting there, little tiny drawings, um, which I still have. I kept some of them. I was I was just was in I got just in the zone. I was completely focused and I from that day on, I, I thought I discovered this amazing new way of making drawings, and and I went back to high school, you know, that in the in the September, and that's all I did for the rest of the senior year. Is I made these trace monotypes. At the time, I didn't know they were trace monotypes. I thought I discovered this new thing <laughs> for a couple of years until. Somebody told me that Gauguin used to do this in Degas, and they're called trace monotypes. And I said, oh, okay, <laughs> I'll share it with them. <laughs> um, and that's what you see, you know, the horse, the image uh, on the event page for my show is a trace monotype with added oil paint, which, you know, won me a, an award uh in high school, and um, I have I have a few of these that, that I saved, and they were all about. Most of them are dark. They're well, all of them are dark. They're about war and death, and you know all, all the things that you try to work out when you're a teenager, uh, or at least I was trying to work out um, existential ideas and, and and things like that. So I I really like going back and looking at them and I I was very influenced by Kathy Colvis and um you know maybe uh just uh the wars that were happening at the time, the Persian Gulf War and um learning about my mother grew up in Nazi Germany and her father was a submarine captain and that had a huge impact on her when she found out about what happened to the Jewish people and um, all these things were being digested by me as, as a teenager. Um, what is God? What is life? You know, all these things. So, um, I, not to interrupt, um, and we'll continue with your story in a minute, but I actually have a caller and I'd like to bring the caller in and it's going to be interesting because our show might get a little bit um, off topic, but I think that's uh, that's an interesting thing to do at this point. What do you think? Sure. 
Bring him on. So, ho- hello, caller. Hi. Who, who, it's Michelle. Hi, who's this? Uh, my name's Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Um, Hi. Do you have a question for, for Barbara or have something to talk about with Barbara? Um, well, I just started listening because um, I'm actually an artist, too, and I just find it interesting, and I was listening to your life because I'm actually a nurse, but my whole life I painted and drew, and my whole message growing up was you're never going to make any money with art, so do something else. And now that I'm 50, (laughs) I'm, like, really trying to pursue it more. You know, I mean, Mm. weekends and evenings, which is hard, but I never really stopped, you know. It's still really my passion, and I just, I don't know, I just found your life interesting. Yeah, that's that's good. Um, I'm glad you never gave it up. I'm glad you didn't put it aside. But uh, if we're not going to make money at it, we we're certainly uh, it's certainly a good uh, good thing to keep our passions rolling. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's a, that's, you, a, that's uh, a really. I just ahead, wanted, Can I comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say that's a really that's a really pertinent part of the story right there, Michelle, that you bring up because I'm sure a lot of people share that same experience and. Uh, you know, in my with my story, um, you know, my mother uh, was a single mother after after I was about six or seven, and and there were three of us, and but she 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 wasn't uh, by by the time I was thirteen, I was pretty independent. I had a job, and I I started I bought a car when I was sixteen, and I was pretty uh, stubborn as well, so I. I I didn't really involve her too much in my decision making, and I was I was kind of um, doing my own thing by the time I was 13. So I I had this romantic notion that I was going to be this starving artist, and and I was it, the idea that romanticized me so much. And I would read about Picasso, Blue Period, and I thought this is what you do as an artist. You learn how to make it with on nothing. And I tell you. If anyone can live in this world on a shoestring, it's me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I really cultivated that ability, you know. And then, it's, and then I realized in my later twenties and thirties, I started to understand spirituality. I, I said, "Oh, okay, I don't have to be a starving artist to <laughs> actually make money doing this." <laughs> it's always hard for me to um, take money too, like when somebody says, oh, how much for this? And I'm always, like, really struggling with it. I always just want to say, oh, just take it, you know? (laughs) Oh, yeah, I know. I know. Believe me. The fun fun part about that, Michelle, the fun part about that, Michelle, is they're actually paying you a compliment by, um, by saying they'd like to exchange a certain number of hours of their own work uh, as a compliment to to your work. True, right. Well, I have begun to take so, money now, but it is it's something I struggle with <laughs> for some reason. Which yeah, is weird we because do. I have no trouble taking money for working, you know, being a nurse, but... So why is that different? I don't know. Well, I think it's like an hourly wage with a certain number of skills uh, in a particular structure gets you a certain salary, right? Yeah. Where, where Where art is so undefined. Yeah, that's true. And there's so, a, there's a lot of Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to add, there's a lot of levels to art buying. I just found out recently that, um, you know, there's such a thing as collectors pooling their money to buy some of these, more, you know, uh, collect uh, large uh, old master works. Um, you know, so there's, there's tiers. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's like a whole other show into itself. So. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So, Michelle, um, are you just listening? And I can. Uh, is it okay if I put you back on hold, or or? Um, oh yeah. Do you want to? I just want to. Okay. Thank okay. you, I'm glad. I'm glad I got Thank you. you. I I'm glad I got you. Uh, okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. So, Barbara, uh, why don't you continue with your story? I know you. Uh, I know you were able to fill in some more of your story um, during uh, during that uh, little break. But uh, keep going. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So. Um, so I did receive a lot of encouragement in high school from my teacher, Miss Miss Margaret Minardi, uh, who is. Uh, continues to be an artist, and we we're friends on Facebook. Uh, and um, um, I started to I knew I wanted to go to art school, and uh, there were some arguments with with my mom, but not, you know, she knew. I think this is what I wanted to do, and um, so she didn't. I, again, I was very independent. I, I looked at schools by myself. I did everything by myself, uh, and um, and I was lucky to have, I call it, my own art residency. You know, my mother was paying the rent, and I, and I could be in the basement making art. You know, <laughs> all the time. Um, so uh, you know, she's a part of my success for sure, and. Um, continues to be to this day, even though she's not alive anymore. Um, but she's with me. And anyway, um, so I decided to go for illustration uh, at Sy- to Syracuse University. And, of course, while there, I gravitated towards uh, Jerome Witkin's painting and drawing classes um, more than the illustration classes in my professors would get frustrated at me because I, I wasn't developing a style. And as hard as I tried, I couldn't seem to develop a style. Cause it, even to the day I graduated, you know, they all said I was talented. And, you know, and I moved to New York City, and I went to uh, one of those portfolio days where all the editors come and they look at your portfolios. And I had Scholastic, and I had HarperCollins, all the big names love my work, and they all said the same thing. It's too fine arty. Uh, it's too, it needs just a little bit more consistency so that we know what we're getting, you know, if we hire you. And um, and it was always the same. It was always the same comment. Uh, so I, you know, you know why I said to myself, F this. <laughs> I'm going to, I want to show in galleries. Uh, this is this is obviously this is what I need to do. So I got myself a, a basement studio under the Williamsburg Bridge. This is in 2000, and um, and I called it Barb's Basement Studios. And I met um, Cal, who introduced me. He he was a builder and one of these people who does everything and just knows everyone. And he introduced me to get real art on 5th Avenue and 20th Street. And they took me in and they showed my work. And I was selling my work and I was making these paintings down there in the basement. And I had Sarkana down there in the basement with me making their own paint, you know, mixing their own paint down there. It was great. Um, And uh, and I sold work at this gallery. Um, And I remember sitting in my studio and I wanted to do the still life, uh, from life of a candle, and um, and I got really frustrated because I didn't know how to start it, and I wanted this to be like an old master painting, and I I had no idea how to start it and what the steps were, and I couldn't do it. I had been working from photographs mostly uh, for the work I was selling, and um, and I. I think I talked with uh, Sarkana next door, and she told me about um, Charles Cecil Studios, or, or uh, what was it at the time? There was a studios in Dumbo, um, 
which then moved to Manhattan. I don't know if they still exist, but these are. So I I got introduced Dumbo, to this. You you got a you got a place. A, you got introduced to somebody in Dumbo. Yeah, there was. Um, he started out in Dumbo. Now he's in Manhattan. I don't know if he's still in Manhattan, but it's it's one of these ateliers. Um, I don't know why I'm blanking on the name right now. Oh, Jacob Collins. It was Jacob Collins. So I met with Jacob Collins in Dumbo, and he said, well, if you want to come here, you have to commit. You have to be really serious and commit. I think he said five years. And uh, I was kind of like, okay, well, if I'm going to commit to five years, I want to go to Italy. (laughs) 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 And so... I uh, so I did. I um, except I didn't have any money, so I couldn't I couldn't afford the Florence Academy. But I figured, well, if I'm in Florence, something will happen. You know, that that's the way I always thought. And uh, and sure enough, I did. You know, I I just kept on talking to people and being introduced to people, and I eventually met this sculptor, Mario Pacchioli, who now has a school in Florence, and we're still in touch. And he took me under his wing and, and we did some drawing together and he tried to convince me to be a sculptor and, and uh, he wanted me to go to the um, the free school in, in Florence. Uh, but in the end, I I wanted to study with a painter. You know, I just wasn't finding what I needed, what I was looking for. And uh, I went back to New York City after a year of Florence and and to take a break and figure out, you know, I thought I was going to become a Piazza painter. I thought, all right, let me let me go back to New York. I'll hang out with my brother in New York City for a month, collect some money, and um, go back and, you know, and maybe I'll be a Piazza painter. Maybe that's what I'll do. And instead, I, I took a class at the Art Students League uh, thinking I'll just stay warm. And uh, who do I meet but Nelson Shanks? at the Art Students League, who I've never heard of before. But in his bio, he wrote about Pietro Anagoni. And this is a name that I knew because Mario Pacchioli would talk about Anagoni all the time. That was his teacher. So I thought, well, this guy, Nelson, mentions Anagoni. Well, and he's, I looked at his work, and he's a great painter. I'm going to take his class. And... uh, he saw my work, he saw my drawing in the in the classroom and and he invited me to show him my portfolio. Uh and I was thrilled. So his uh studio assistant um at the time, uh uh Ishmael Checo, Ismail, uh, who was just in the Sanic Gallery show with me in, in uh Philadelphia in, in September. We we were in a show together honoring Nelson Shanks. There were 39 artists in the show. Uh, he he escorted me down to Philly, down to Bucks County, and on the train with my portfolio. Here I was, 27. And um, I, I arrive at Nelson's mansion and all, all this beautiful art everywhere. And I'm invited in to I'm laying my drawings on the floor in front of all his antique furniture. And I'm just like, I feel like I'm in a dream, like in a movie. And all my portfolio is horses. It's like the monotype horses that you see on the Facebook page. Um, the, the, those were the bulk of what I did uh, in high school and um, and in my early 20s uh, were these horses. So I, I didn't mention, I, I grew up mostly drawing horses. That was all I drew practically. And... Um, so uh, so he looked at my drawings and he said, I want to give you a full scholarship to come to Philadelphia. I opened up a school and I would like you to, to go to my school. Don't go back to Italy, he said. <laughs> I, told him, I told him my story. He said, I'll be your mentor. Don't go back to Italy. Come to my school. And I said, yes. And so there there it was. I had my return ticket to Italy, but it was an open-ended ticket. At the time, you could buy an open-ended ticket as a student. And um, and I decided to move to Philly. And uh, that was an adventure. Uh, and that was my the beginning of my uh, classical training at, at 27. And um, I was thrilled. I was learning discipline and patience and all the skills that I uh, 
um, wanted to be able to paint and draw like uh, the people, the painters I admired in the uh, textbooks. And um, so, so that uh, that was a turning point for me. And um, I stayed there for two years, and then I. Uh, how do I put it? I um, a couple of things happened, uh, and I decided I was going to leave the school um, to embark on my own uh, painting series. And uh, Nelson didn't really want me to leave, but I I I, I wanted to leave. I I guess I had to leave at the time. Uh, I used to do my own thing for a little while, and uh, I <laughs> I went and I painted. I was on a high. I just was with all the skills that I got. I felt like I could just paint anything, and I was so thrilled with color and um, the ability to just break anything that I saw down into simple shapes and forms and. Um, I just was on a high, and I and I did these three by five foot paintings uh, based on Bacchus, and I enlisted help from my friends and as models and my life, you know, people in my life. I sort of just felt almost like small scale film in a, in a sense, you know, looking back because I had I had like this photographer with me, and I. I was sort of composing these scenes and I had my friends as models and we all got into like what I was trying to create and everyone was part of it and I loved this idea of working you know with a group of people together on something with a small a small group of people um my sister's friend who's a professional photographer came up from Philly uh from Washington DC with his equipment and we did a night shoot um for, for a Bacchus painting that's still in progress, actually, and um, and uh, so yeah, so I I spent maybe three years uh, doing that, and um, and it was great. And then my mother got cancer, and uh, I decided I was gonna put a pause on everything. I was I was 31 and move in with her and, uh, you know, help her through chemo. And and that uh, that's sort of, you know, people people have kids sometimes and then that interrupts, you know, their, their art career or whatever they're doing, you know, for maybe five years or seven years or more. So I, I kind of look at it that way. It was, it was sort of like this time period where I, I still painted and drew, but it, it was on a very, uh, it was more like a trickle, you know, and, um, and my, uh, my spiritual practice and grew into other, into other avenues and deepened, and, um, uh, yeah, it was a very, maybe it was sort of like a, a rest period in a sense, um, because I see things as cycles. And I decided um, after that period of about three years of being with her to, I thought I would maybe need to do something else other than art to make money. So I I said, well, let me be an ESL teacher. This way I can live abroad. So I, I got myself a certificate and I got a job in South Korea teaching English and you know God works, and I always say I, I God is a wanker. I love him because <laughs> um, like three months into my teaching job, I had this um, this day where I serendipi- serendipitously met a Korean painter. I actually walked into his house. Uh, because the door was open and I saw paintings on the wall. I was like biking around, just exploring the neighborhood, and and I see these beautiful oil paintings. And I parked my bike and I walked in and I'm just like going up the stairs, looking at all the paintings. And they're like, one of them has Jesus carrying the cross with thorns on his head, and 
another one's a self-portrait, and I get up to the second floor, and I look through the glass doors, and I see this amazing studio. Nobody's there with time, so I leave my card, because I, I say to myself, i got to be in that studio. And sure enough, I get a call back. They invite me to dinner, and, I, and I'm now I'm painting in his studio every Saturday. Um, so I, even though I was working as an ESL teacher Monday to Friday, all day, get home at 7.30 p.m., my Saturday morning, I was painting. So it was, it's funny. Every, every time I, um, I think, you know, that I need to be something else other than art, you know, in, in my younger, when I turned 30-something, you know, 30, 31, 32, I thought, well, if I'm not making money by now, that must mean that I'm doing the wrong thing, you know. And so, uh, but then I get these signs that, that no, it, this is what you're meant to be doing. And um, I stayed an extra three months, four months in Korea after my contract, and I, and I taught an art workshop. And I realized as I was teaching the workshop that I still had more to learn, and I wanted to be a better teacher. So I, I called up Nelson. This was like, I don't know, seven seven years after I left, I think. And um, I said, I'd like to come back to Incominati and finish now that you guys have a professional program. And he said, sure, come on back. <laughs> and I did. I came back. So and um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the, uh, the interrupter of the story for a moment because sure. I need to take a break. And so let's take a break, and we'll pick up the story with uh, you coming back to uh, go to school again. So I'll okay. uh, encourage all our listeners to uh, listen to the, the break music, which is Out of the Bard, How and Toe.
tune in to International Pagan Radio. You can hear your favorite artists such as Dave the Bard, Tuatha Dea, Spiral Rhythm, S.J. Tucker, Murphy's Midnight Rounders, and many, many more. Join us for exciting shows like Ask a Witch and Storytime with Rook as well. www.internationalpaganradio.com on the net or on TuneIn Radio on your mobile devices. Join us on Facebook and Twitter too. International Pagan Radio, all pagan, all the time. Welcome back to an emerging forest on the Spiritual Unity Radio Network. We hope everyone was able to stretch their legs and get a drink. And now, back to Alan. Well, welcome back, everyone. And we're certainly, we're certainly here to listen to Barbara's story. That's one of the reasons why we're here. But I'm also here to uh, respect uh, an hour or an hour and five or ten minute time uh, limit that we want to draw on this program because Barbara has a show next Sunday – and that's one of the things that we want to talk about. So I will make a, a note, and I know Barbara will make a note, that the next time she's on the show, and there will be a next time because her st- story is so interesting, um, we're going to pick it up um, when she's leaving South Korea to go back to in Comandante to uh, pick up her formal training uh, once again. How does that sound, Barbara? Sure. You want me to pick up from there? No, basically, we're we're going to leave it to another show. Mm-hmm. Oh, and got it, what got we're it. going to do what we're, what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, talk about. I mean, they're they're. I would have I would like to have gotten through your entire story, but um we didn't. There isn't enough room for your entire story in the in the time limit that we've set ourselves. And so I'm going to leave your story for another time. It's a, a fabulous story. I mean, I wanna stay up till eleven o'clock to hear it all, but I also want to respect uh what we set out to do which was to create a product that would uh, basically help you next Sunday. And uh, we set up these, we set up basically things to talk about. So everybody out there who's listening, there are three images that are embedded into the Facebook Facebook event. And they're also on the event for... uh, the event for next Sunday's uh, event that's on Barbara's page. So Barbara has an event for next Sunday, which is her show at Well Point Oriental Medicine on, at 21st at Ish and um, and Fairmount. So why don't you talk about your um, sort of your your show and sort of where it came from and what it's about. And then uh, David, who's on now, can get into uh, talking about the, the particular images uh, that we're going to talk about tonight. Of course, many more uh, pictures will be available at the art show and sale, but we're going to talk about three of them because you and I sort of picked them out to be um, examples of your early, middle, and later period of uh, of uh, this Chris. Sure. So this short this this show came about. Um, it was really good timing. Um, actually, I am 40, and I feel like um, I'm at a sort of turning point in my career where um, I really feel like I'm gonna, uh, ex- you know, explode into some really great new 
paintings. Um, so it was really, it's a really great timing to take a moment and sort of look back at everything I've done up till now. And um, I'm really excited to have had this opportunity. Well Point Oriental Medicine is, is a, a, it's a pretty big space. So, and I, I was given a generous, pretty much free reign of the place. Um, uh, Adam has been really great host, and uh, so it um, it's going to um, you know a lot of the work is going to be fairly recent, and then there will be some pieces uh, from my teens and twenties as well. Um, and uh, yeah, the first piece that you see with the horses is pretty typical looks, you know, that that's how my work looked uh, from, I'd say, 16 to 20, and, uh, or 16 to 18 before going into college, and uh, I, actually, the first piece of art I ever sold was, was a horse done in this style to a lawyer up in Syracuse. I had a, a show at a coffee house, and um, he bought it. He and his wife were sitting under it and getting a divorce, and they looked up and they <laughs> saw this horse, and they and the horse just embodied the moment that they were in. It was sort of this, you know, I so the, these horses that I do... Um, they're sort of this vehicle for emotion, and um, uh, they're just always—they've always drawn me for that reason. Um, They're—they're they're just a wonderful vehicle for emotion, and and they stuff that they saw in it, and. Uh, I continue to say, do these horses that sort of I've always I always will so it's always something I'll do it's like 30 to 45 percent of what I do Barbara it's David I had so, a good question for you hi David Oops, go ahead Alan. go ahead no my, my my question was uh about the horses so uh the, these two when did you, you when did you do these this painting this was in 94 the drawing, the drawing. okay yeah all right and uh, it's it's great it's a great piece. If anyone is is on Facebook, they can look at it from the you know from the page um, for the event. You can see it. And uh, what's interesting about it is that they they both seem to be going in in different directions. And uh, and one horse is is much more muscular, and the other horse is more like a, a Mustang. Was that was that a plan hmm. or? Um... No. So with this drawing method. Um... What what's really great about it is it, it's almost like if anyone's familiar with art therapy, when when you're when you're drawing um, and you're accessing, you know, your inner subconscious, uh, you know, you can things you'll just well for me I'll I'll draw something that is you know exemplifies what's going on in my inner world and and that happens with most anyone um when when drawing when when allowed to just feel free uh and not you know judged and so um yeah so i with the, this drawing method sort of allows me to enter that space almost immediately because it's very uh, immediate and it's also um, so anyway so so what you're what you're noticing David um, yeah it, I can start to analyze it too and and think well it's probably you know two aspects of my inner mm. psyche uh, maybe you can even say the masculine and the feminine um, mm. yeah what's the title uh, Ode to Susan Rothenberg, um, and I. <laughs> Susan Rothenberg is an artist uh, who, uh, when I was in high school, I, I was looking at her work. Um, my teacher 
suggested I look at her work and see how she um, creates compositions and and uh, so it it. It, I don't know that it, it doesn't necessarily say say much about what's going on in this piece. It's just sort of um, mm-hmm. loosely affiliated with uh, somebody who I was looking at at the time. That's great. Thank you. Alan, you were yeah. going to say something? No, keep going. <laughs> um, can we talk about the uh, the other painting? I believe it's, it's one of your Bacchus paintings. Yeah, the muse. Yeah, so that... Um, I painted a lot of that, maybe 65% of it outdoors on site behind my apartment building in West Philly was a broken down carriage house. And Mm. I thought it looked like Rome to me. And uh, so I brought my my four by four foot canvas out there and I would paint the wall, you know, while these Polish workers were up there on the roof behind me working on their whatever they were doing and playing, blasting their Polish techno. A couple of times I yelled at them. <laughs> That's and, an inter- uh, interesting combination of music. <laughs> I know. Um, and then I had uh, Pan is uh, uh, my friend, was my friend's boyfriend at the time, and, and he's a construction worker, and he was the perfect Pan model. Um, so he he modeled for that, and... I met somebody in a coffee house who had the hair I wanted, so I asked her if she would model for me, and she and she agreed. I forget her name. Um, and so I took photographs of them, and I worked. I did a color sketch from life, and then I used the photographs to um, work on the painting while they weren't there. And then the rest, you know, the background and all of that I did while I was standing out there and working. And... Um, yeah, it was it was part of the series I wanted to do, um, and I picked Bacchus as the theme because uh, I, I had been bartending. I was I was a bartender for ten years, and um, I also I was ex- you know exploring um, these the ideas of uh, around you know, the, uh, what do you call it, Um, um, the unconscious force within us uh, that people would write about over the years. They they called the the Bacchic energy, the sort of Bacchic frenzy. Um, You know, this was, I was sort of fascinated by what that meant and I was exploring what that was and I was exploring spirituality and um, what that was. So I I see these as multifaceted, you know, sometimes at one point I called them um, different aspects of love, like brotherly love, platonic love, sexual love. You know, or allegories of love. At one point, I called them that. So, um, yeah. So they, Bacchus, kind of made the theme, you know, be congruous. But then they can also go in other directions. It's a very evocative piece. Are you they, are you going to have the other ones from that series um, for the show as well? Um, I'd like to. I they're they're large, so um, I think maybe for the one day for the opening, I might be able to. Um, mm-hmm. Sort of logistically, I have to I have to see. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say maybe this one will definitely be there, and hopefully the other the other three will be there too. There's one that's in progress, so it it would be fun to to bring that one too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's, it's interesting you said you painted it in Philadelphia because it has a feel like you have done it in Italy. There's a very uh, <laughs> European feel to it with the, the kind of um, with the vines and things growing up to the cracked pavement and just the whole feel. It's a really, it's a really, uh, like I said, evocative piece and, and really looks like something that would you would see uh, in 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 Italy or or even uh, Greece or France, the Mediterranean. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. It's in me. (laughs) (laughs) 
and, and the third piece um, is is quite is quite different from the variety of, of your pieces that are catch me. Um, and this is uh, what, what would this be considered? Is it considered a still life or yeah? Okay. Yeah, this is a still life, and and you could also find this in Italy. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly the coffee, right? <laughs> So this is like what I have every morning. Um, yeah, so I, I started doing these still lifes um, last year after graduating, uh, or maybe it's two years now. And um, it's they're, they're really explorations into light. And the, a, a lot of the focus with these is on edges and really playing with um, how how to capture light and uh this is this is uh you know the the age old pursuit of um, um of the of artists you know from the renaissance and and, bef- and before that and of course as we know at the turn of the 19th hundreds art sort of went in all different directions but if we if we continue along the continuum of where western art was going um, you know, this sort of this is this is I'm I'm right there, you know, standing on the shoulders of those who came before me and um and so for me I'm I'm interested in exploring in this piece. Um if you look at the left side of the coffee cafeteria I call it, um you can see the pink of the reflected light is blends right back into the background and you, you don't even see an edge there and uh, I, I love this piece because I was really successful at editing what I needed and just um, leaving leaving in what I needed and leaving out what I didn't need so I was really proud when I painted this because I, I edited it and it reads really well um, and uh, you know to, for me that was like a, a great moment and capturing the metal, capturing the reflection of the light, getting the color right, the value right, um, the drawing and and just I just loved the color um combination of the whole piece. And uh so yeah, so I've I've been doing a lot of these little still lifes with, with just the intent of being uh very simple and Having the focus on the light and the objects are sort of the second. Second, they're not as important as just how how is the light, how does the light look, what is the light situation, and uh, the objects I just happen to, they're whatever I mostly whatever I have around me, and I just see, a lot of times I'll just come across them, sitting there, and there's a certain light on them, and then I say, oh, that's what I want to paint. I want to get that light. Uh, so I, I have a feeling I'll be doing this for a while, you know, just sort of falling in love with like a lighting situation on something, and then bringing my easel to it sometimes even. What's this uh, piece titled? Is this title Cafeteria? Which I don't even know if that's a real word. I. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I do speak you Italian. Said the title has uh, to be a real world. Right, right, exactly. The show coming up. Um, what uh, what can people expect? This looks like it's going to be a very uh, a very festive event, and uh, yeah. uh, see that you have um, Christmas lights and and things. So maybe you could tell uh-huh. us more about uh, what the show will be like to to attend the opening. Sure. Yeah, there I'm gonna there's gonna be Christmas lights and I'm hoping that my friend will play her accordion. Um uh and uh there's gonna be some light fair and uh either there will be wine. I'm thinking about making glue vine, which is a German tradition, um, of heated wine with a little bit of um well my mom would use vermouth. In it, mixed in with it, and spices um, like uh, I think star anise and cinnamon, and uh, I think maybe I'm not sure if she added sugar. My sister has the recipe, 
Um, so yeah, so music, art, food, um, lights, and uh, yeah, and and just you know people and art. So we could so we great. get to like the uh, the specifications of uh, where you know what what facility um, what time and all that good stuff. Yeah, it's um it's across from the penitentiary, which a lot of people know in Philly. And for those who aren't so familiar with Philly, it's in the Art Museum District. Uh, it's on Fairmount Avenue, 2014 Fairmount Avenue. There's a lot of coffee houses nearby. It's a cute street. There's a, there's restaurants and little shops. Um, there's a little hardware store across the street. And uh, um, it's from 12 to 7, so it's it's during the day. I decided to make it like that because I, I, I used to do Philadelphia Open Studio tours and I like, you know, the stretch of time where people can come in and out and it's like a whole day event. And uh, you can bring your kids, you know, you can be on your way somewhere. Um, also, when I like doing the Rittenhouse Art Show, and, you know, that's like an all-day event. So I just thought, why don't I do that? And also, when somebody purchases the art, they can take it home with them. So I, it has the feel of being sort of an open studio or like the Rittenhouse Art Show, where you just, you know, you purchase the art and then you're, you get to leave with it that day. And uh, the the Well Point Acupuncture, Well the Well Point Oriental Medicine uh, Clinic has a bathroom um, and places to sit. So and if someone were to uh, to not have you know, vehicle, what's what's the easiest way to get there? What uh, what transit? Um, there are buses that go okay. in that vicinity. Yeah, I don't know which bus, um, but uh, that would be the, the best way. Um, the trolley, it would, it would be a bit of a walk from the trolley, so I would suggest a bus. Um, there are definitely okay. buses that go up and down Fairmont Avenue, so that you can you can look up on SEPTA, SEPTA's website. And right. um, parking is pretty easy around there, I'd say. And it's this coming Saturday, correct? Sunday. This Sunday coming is Sunday. coming Sunday. Yeah, from 12 to 7. Well, I, I think this is uh, really good timing as... We're, we're running into a lot of really good timing uh, in general. Okay. And thank you, uh, thank you so much for uh, being on the show, for telling a part of your story, um, and for uh, also, you know, getting getting this part of the of the of the show uh, done in in really in a really nice time uh, line. That of course you know, helps the the listener to to uh, get what they want in a in in the hour. And if someone so basically, um, if you would give your uh, contact information, you know, like where can people see your work uh, and all that good stuff, sure. Barbara. Oh sure, you can go to barbarazanelli.com and. Uh, yeah, the event will be on that page right when you open up, and uh, and then also my artwork. And if you, um, my email's on there. If you want to contact me, feel free to contact me. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, David, what's your contact information again? Uh, it's my email address, uh, dwhitman0906 at gmail.com. Great, thanks so much. And as always, my name is Alan Ritter. I my email address is r i t t e r period a l a n eighty eight at gmail dot com. If you would like, if you are interested in being on the show, 
um, please email me. I also have a small produce co-op in the southeastern Pennsylvania, southern New Jersey area called the Produce Club, Philadelphia, PA. Although I am located in Collingswood, New Jersey, go figure. Um, we are presently hosted on Facebook, but you can find us by going to produceclub.us or by emailing me and asking me, you know, like, what's up? Um, we have service in West Philly. We have service if you want to meet us at the markets in uh, by the um, Walt Whitman, at the foot of the Walt Whitman Bridge, just on Front Street. And we have service over in southern New Jersey. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And uh, I know all three of our, all, all three of us, echo the same thing. Uh, uh, go for it. Um, do what you feel that you need to do. Um, the situation might get a little bit uncomfortable, but uh, as Barbara was saying, uh, here she here there she is over in South Korea teaching uh, ESL, and uh, the, the painting just reaches out and grabs her again and pulls her back in. So. Thank you, uh, David, for being on the show tonight. You're welcome, Alan. And thank you to our special guest, uh, Barbara Zanelli, whose show is at the or- is at the Wellpoint Oriental Medicine, 2014 Fairmount Avenue, this coming Sunday, the 3rd of December, from noon until 7 p.m., and you can get in touch with her by going to barbarazzanelli.com and seeing her uh, her email address or and, or and seeing the address, the sorry, seeing the event um, for this Sunday. Or you can contact me and say, hey, I forgot all that. Hey, Alan, what's going on? Let me get me in touch with Barbara, and I can easily do that. Or also, you can get in touch with David to do the same thing. Um, Thank you so much to uh, to both of you for making this another really interesting episode, and uh, have a great week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Spiritual Unity Radio Network. Join us seven nights a week for exciting programming covering a variety of expressions of faith. And remember... All manifestations of the divine are equally valid.